I had planned on doing a shirt tutorial next, but I just can't stop thinking about gloves. So in this video I will make two different pairs of gloves. I made my very first pair of leather gloves back in 2018 and my second pair in 2020, and both of them were pretty bad. After that I didn't make any more until the autumn of 2023 when I made five more pairs. My sewing technique keeps improving with every pair, and I'm still making very slight adjustments to my pattern every time I sew it up. I really hope some of you try sewing gloves, they are not as difficult as they look. The pattern fitting can be quite tedious, but once you've got that done, the sewing up is pretty straightforward. Also, I made a mistake in my previous video. I forgot to label one of the functional buttonholes on the beige 1720s coat, even though I've made a coat with that exact same buttonhole arrangement before. And I'm annoyed that I can't go back and fix it. My pattern is based on the diagrams from Diderot's Encyclopedia, which has a lot of volume spread out over two decades, but this one is from 1768. It consists of a large piece called the trank, with fingers and a thumb hole, a thumb, which has indents on the sides to line up with that point at the top of the thumb hole, which is meant to line up with that little ridge of skin between your hand and thumb. There are three V-shaped pieces called fourchettes, which go in between the fingers. On my first version of the pattern I had these in two halves, but after my first two pairs I joined them together like they are in the Diderot pattern. It's nicer not having that extra seam there, and there's fewer pieces to keep track of. And a small diamond-shaped piece, called a quirk, which goes in the inner corner of each of those fourchettes. These are in the Diderot pattern too, and are also something I left out of my first pattern, but I added them after my third pair and they were a huge improvement. The version without them is not horrible, but it really doesn't fit well in that area. With my garment patterns, I always make them so that the pattern itself doesn't include seam allowance, but with gloves, there's only about 1.5 millimeters of seam allowance at most, so it's best to just include it in the pattern. Since I drafted my first version of this pattern back in 2018, I don't remember exactly what I did, but I do know that I started by picking apart and tracing a modern glove and then making a lot of changes to it, and that was a pretty terrible way to go about doing it, especially since that glove didn't even fit me. Modern glove patterns are so different from 18th century ones that it makes more sense to start just by measuring and tracing the hand. I wanted to film the pattern process as I would do it today, but I didn't want to draft another pattern for me when I already have a pattern that fits me, so... This is Lee, my friend from college who has hands and no glove pattern to fit them. It's a shame! Yes. So we're going to draft a glove pattern. After checking my own measurements against my glove pattern, I started by measuring around the widest part of Lee's hand, just above the thumb. I was going to draw two parallel lines that distance apart, but it turned out to be exactly the same measurement as the width of a sheet of printer paper, so I didn't have to. I drew a line down the center and traced Lee's hand on one side, with the thumb near the middle of the paper, trying to keep the pencil pointed straight down. Because the quirks extend slightly further into the hand than the traced lines, I made the gaps between fingers a bit lower than they are on the tracing. I redrew the fingers to be more even, but tried to keep the width and length the same. For the width, I guessed based on the finger circumference compared to how wide I wanted the fourchettes to be which I'll talk about more when we get to the fourchettes. My fourchettes are about three quarters the width of the two middle finger pieces on the trank, which I think is nicely proportional. The index finger is by far the widest one on the trank, because it's got a wrap around three sides of that finger, which only has a fourchette on one side. The pinky portion of the trank also needs to be a bit wider, because, just like the index finger, it only has a fourchette on one side. The one I drew here turned out way too big because I overestimated. I drew the thumb hole by eye, with the center about 1.5 centimeters in from the center of the main pattern piece, on the palm side. I cut out the finished half of the pattern, folded it along the center line, and traced it to get the other side. Because the pointy ends of the fourchette stick down even further than the quirks do, I cut the slits about 8 or 9 millimeters further into the back of the hand. Instead of just making a cut in the paper, I'm removing a tiny rectangle of it, because we're going to need the pen to be able to get in there to trace it. I folded the pattern again, this time along the center of the thumb hole, and cut it out. I tried measuring how much thumb protruded from the thumb hole, and adding another 1.5 centimeters, but that still ended up being too short. I sketched out a rough thumb shape, making sure it was the same width as the measurement around Lee's thumb knuckle, and I rolled the cutout thumb hole piece around it to make sure it dipped in at the right point. But then I drew it bigger anyways, because otherwise the base of the thumb looked disproportionately small. I had to go back and make the thumb hole a bit wider in order to fit it better, 
When the thumb was finished, I folded it in half and cut it out, adding a little notch to mark the middle of the bottom. Then I added back some extra to the bottom of the thumb hole because the thumb looked too flat by comparison. I should have just traced a new version of the thumb and rounded it out more. This was my first time drafting a glove pattern like this and I was just making it up as I went along, so it's definitely not the best way to do it, but it did turn out pretty good eventually. The base of the thumb is still bigger than the thumb hole on the pattern pieces, but remember there is seam allowance included on these. For the fourchettes, I needed to compare the circumference of Lee's fingers to the combined widths of the corresponding pattern pieces. The combined widths of all my pattern pieces for one finger is about one centimeter more than the circumference of that finger. That sounds like a lot of seam allowance for something so small, but the middle two fingers have four pieces, which is eight different edges that all need seam allowance. So even though it's only one to 1.5 millimeters, it adds up. I added one centimeter to each of Lee's finger measurements and then subtracted the combined widths of that finger's pieces on the top and bottom of the pattern. Here are some diagrams, in case I haven't explained that well enough. No need to screenshot them, I have put them in the accompanying blog post, which is linked in the description. I drew a slightly curved V shape and made each side the same length as the finger it needs to attach to, measuring the longer slits on the back of the hand, because these are the top seams on the fingers. I numbered the fingers and each half of the fourchettes, but on my final pattern I just labeled the fourchettes and the spaces between fingers. Instead of being a straight V shape on the inner corner, they curved down to make room for the quirks. After cutting out the first fourchette, I traced the outer edge so that the other two would have the same angle. For the quirk, I just drew a little diamond shape with slightly convex edges. You can also make the fourchettes straight and split them down the middle like this. I don't know when that started, but as we'll see later, it appears to be the case on the late 18th century gloves that inspired this project. If you're short on leather, it would make for a slightly more efficient cutting layout. I've not actually used these pieces in a glove yet, and will be interested to see if there's any difference in fit. One more note about the fingers. I've realized it's best to make the tips relatively flat because having a fourchette on either side is going to change the way it tapers, and if you leave the end too round you'll end up with this ugly little flappy thing. It's alright over long pointy nails, but will not fit smoothly over short ones. Although if you want to make your fourchettes a bit longer than the finger piece so they meet in the middle, then the rounder end is fine. It's important to true your pieces after drafting a pattern, but I seem to have forgotten to do that here, with the exception of the thumb hole. But the fingers will most likely need adjusting anyways, and it's easy to change the length of them. You don't want to make mock-ups out of real leather because that would be a horrible waste of money, but thankfully Lee had this thin one-way stretch vinyl that was just perfect. The stretch goes around the hand, and I traced it in white gel pen because it's the only thing I've found that actually leaves a mark on darker colored leather. Since this is the mock-up, I also wrote the numbers on the pieces. I didn't film the mock-up construction because it was just like the gloves I'm about to show you, only with much larger stitches and I didn't close up all the fingers. For the second version, I traced the pattern onto cardstock. The index finger ended up being a bit too narrow, and the middle two a bit too wide, so I moved those lines over. I redrew the finger lines where they needed to be wider or narrower, and took some of the width off the side where it turned out to be too loose. Remember not to taper the wrist though, you will still need to get the widest part of your hand through there. When patterning the fingers, it's best to err on the side of too long, because you can easily trim down the tips when you're sewing them up, but you can't add extra bits of leather on. Or you could, but it would look really bad. I don't like to fold my cardstock patterns, but this won't be the final version. Just like before, I'm cutting out the half that I altered and tracing it to make the second half, with the only difference between the two halves being the slightly longer slits on the top of the hand. I prefer to cut the thumb holes on my patterns with an X-Acto knife, but there weren't any immediately available in Lee's sewing room, so I folded that too. I added another 1.5 centimeters to the thumb and made it a little wider. 
the four sets longer where they needed to be. Lee's going to sew this up in the vinyl again before making any out of real leather, because it will definitely need more little adjustments. Everything is so small in these patterns that even a few millimeters makes a difference. Success! We have a pattern! That fits. It should fit better than the mock-up next time it's sewn up. And hopefully, we'll have closed fingers. Yes, definitely. <laughs> you're, you're gonna... Well, you wouldn't stop there, no. No, gosh, no. no. Meanwhile, despite having already made a lot of little changes to my own pattern, I noticed that the seams at the base of the fingers on the backs of my gloves were pulling towards the thumb an awful lot. So I moved the thumb hole in that direction by tracing a rectangle around it and adding 4mm to the palm side, in the same direction as the seams were pulling. I cut around this rectangle, flipped it over, and taped it back in. Now the thumb hole is 4mm further into the palm. I left my basic pattern short so that I can use it for late 18th century and also add larger cuffs onto it if I want to, because there's quite a variety of cuff shapes over the century. In the last few decades of the century, coat sleeves were getting longer and tighter, so late 18th century gloves are pretty short. Most everyday gloves would have been pretty plain, but on the fancy 18th century pairs that have made it into museums, there's a wide variety of decoration and even more on the 17th century ones. 17th century gloves are amazing and you should go look at pictures of them. But for this video I'm going to make my own version of a late 18th century printed pair. In the late 18th and I think even more in the early 19th century you see a lot of really detailed printed gloves, including this delightful pair from the MFA Boston collection which is printed with light gray stripes and a black medallion on the back. They're from that late 1780s to early 90s period when stripes were the most fashionable thing ever and everyone was putting them on everything. The Met also has a pair of ladies' gloves with very similar stripes. I liked the idea of medallions on the backs of the gloves, but I didn't want a couple embracing on mine, so I did a dragon instead. A lot of the 18th century European dragon images I found were just little wormy guys with two legs, or no legs at all. Interestingly, they don't seem to have as many reptile features as modern dragons do, instead having an odd mix of bird and mammal parts. I collected a Pinterest board full of reference dragons, which I will link in the description, along with my glove Pinterest board. I sketched from these for a few pages and then started trying to fit them into a circle. I ended up with what I hope is a fairly generic looking dragon by late 18th century standards. I used a piece of painter's tape to make sure I got the exact size and placement that I wanted, though I made the mistake of trying to account for the thumb hole alteration, forgetting that the thumb seam would be in the same place on my hand either way. Now it was time to paint some samples. My leather is this 0.6mm undyed lambskin from Italian Skins on Etsy. It's a nice weight for gloves, but you could go thinner. Transferring designs onto glove leather is a bit of a challenge. Carbon paper doesn't work unless you press hard enough to shred the paper, and the lines are awfully smudgy. Pencils barely leave a mark unless they're really soft, and they're also pretty smudgy. Fine-tipped waterproof drawing pens show up really well though. So I went with the same method I used the one other time I painted a design on gloves. I traced it onto cardstock using carbon paper and made a rough stencil that I could use to trace out a bunch of little chunks of the outline, which allowed me to draw the rest of the outline with the right proportions. After tracing a practice dragon onto a scrap, I had to fix a couple of spots on my stencil where the outlines weren't quite in the right place. This is why it's always worth it to do samples. It turns out this ink is also a bit smudgy if you touch it too much, but the lines are very thin and will be completely covered by the paint. I'm using Angelus leather paint and I chose dark brown because I think it looks better on natural leather than grey. I can't get the line quality of a copper plate print with my little paintbrush, but the practice dragon turned out pretty good. Now there were only the stripes to sort out. <laughs> 
Painting such tiny stripes posed a bit of a problem, because it's pretty hard to find 3mm tape that's suitable for masking. I got some washi tape from Michael's, but felt bad about it because it's quite expensive and wasteful to use that just for masking. This was the smallest pack at the store, and it only had two tiny rolls in the width I wanted, so I did a little sample in a wider size. It did a great job of masking the paint, but I wasn't sure I had enough of the smaller stuff to do both gloves, and I didn't want to buy another pack. But then I had a better idea. I realized that instead of trying to find narrow tape, I could stick a wide piece of painter's tape to wax paper and cut it into strips as narrow as I wanted. The sample turned out great, even though I did it fairly quickly without measuring, so I'm going to give the washi tape to a friend who will actually use it for its intended purpose. With all the samples done, it was time to trace out the pattern pieces. Leather has varying amounts of stretch in lots of different directions, and when laying out your pattern, it's best to try and make sure that there's more stretch going around the width of the hand. I'm tracing the pieces with another one of those waterproof drawing pens. Since my pattern has the seam allowance included, I'll cut just inside the black lines, so they won't be on the edges of the finished gloves. I cut around the pieces very roughly before painting, to avoid getting paint on the unused portions of leather, and began slicing up tape with a rotary cutter. This was not enough, and I had to do two more strips to finish the smaller pieces. Before masking the stripes on the trank, I first had to mask out a circular area for the dragon. I used wax paper to help with this too, and drew circles the right size with a compass. I measured in from the edges to make sure I placed both circles in the same spot. Without any edges to peel up, I was obliged to use the tip of a pin to separate the tape from the paper. I outlined them in ink before moving on to the stripes. I started with the middle of the thumb hole and worked my way outwards, but starting from the very middle of the pattern itself would be good too. I tried to make the spaces between the tape just slightly narrower than the tape itself. I was doing it by eye, so it's not all perfectly even, but overall pretty good. This paint dries pretty quickly, so I took the tape off right after finishing each piece. 
started the thumbs from the middle too, so the stripes there would line up. I put the stripes along the width of the quirks, but next time I'll do it lengthwise. On both pairs of extant gloves, the stripes on the forchettes run straight along the fingers. From the little bit that's visible in the picture of the MFA ones, I think their forchettes are cut straight. At this time I had not yet made the straight forchette pattern pieces you saw me make earlier in this video, and I still want to test those on a plain pair before I use them for something more time consuming, so I just did my stripes in a V-shape. Otherwise I would have ended up with diagonal stripes, which I didn't want. I taped them all on one side, marked the center on the tape using mechanical pencil, cut those ends off as marked, and then taped the other side. While I'm pretty certain that this is not how the forchettes were done on the original gloves, it would have been entirely possible for them to do. There are plenty more complicated printed to shape things from this era. I pressed all the tape down firmly, and a little bit of paint still got under the edges in a few places where the leather is a bumpier texture, but it's not too noticeable. Now I just had to trace my stencil, finish drawing in the outlines, and paint my dragons. I covered up the rest of the trank with a piece of wax paper, just in case of paint accidents. The print on the MFA gloves has a border of little circles around it. I had sketched out a few different ideas, including zigzags, which were very popular at the time, but in the end I went with simple dots. The paint covered up a good portion of my pattern outlines, so before cutting out I had to go back and retrace the longer ones in white gel pen. I was surprised by how much the leather had stretched and shifted since the first time I traced the pattern pieces. As I was peeling the tape off, I started to worry that maybe all these high contrast 3mm stripes would make it harder to see what was going on with the sewing, and might possibly cause eye strain for some people. And showing the process as clearly as possible is my main goal with these videos, so just to be safe, I made another pair of gloves in plain leather and filmed the construction of those instead. I already had a pair of short ones in that color, so these ones have the larger cuffs that were on the 1760s pattern, and that way I could add a couple more things that I'd never tried before.
For gloves with larger cuffs, I tape an extension piece onto my shorter glove pattern. I've been doing it this way because I'm still making slight improvements to the pattern every time I sew it up, and I don't want to make the same alterations to multiple different patterns. I use painter's tape and stick it to fabric first to make it less sticky, and it usually doesn't damage the paper. Just like before, I'm laying the pieces out so that more of the stretch will go across the width of the hand, and tracing the pieces with a waterproof drawing pen. I have tried using washable markers for this, but it smudges everywhere if your hands are even the tiniest bit sweaty. The Diderot pattern includes facings, and I've seen examples of 18th century gloves both with facings and without. I had never put facings on my gloves before, but figured I should try it, so I used my pattern extension piece to cut those. Using this pattern piece was a bad idea, and I really should have made a new one. The facings are a slightly different color because they're from a different hide. I carefully cut inside all the lines, leaving no ink on the final pieces. Another thing I'd never tried before is those three lines of decorative stitching down the back of the hand. Not all 18th century gloves have them, but a lot of them do. There's a variety of different looking stitches, and some have little bits of embroidery there, but I'm going to go with just one line of whip stitching. There are some extant pairs that look like they have two rows, but they also look like they're made of much thinner leather than what I have, and the sample I did turned out fairly thick. I sketched out the lines on my pattern, and cut holes so I could mark the ends, and drew them on with white gel pen so as not to leave a permanent stain. To sew these up, I'm using silk yarn, which is not the best thing because it doesn't have as much twist as silk sewing thread, and therefore won't hold up to wear as well, but I have a lot of it. I should stop doing that though, I really need to order more silk quilters twist. I always wax my glove sewing thread. I'm using leather needles for these, but I have sewn up quite a few gloves with just a regular needle. It's a lot easier with leather needles though, because they have three flat sides on the pointy end, which gives them little blades that cut through the leather. Regular needles can sew through leather this thin, but it takes a lot more effort. The one I'm using for this pair is size 7, which is a bit bigger than it needs to be. I ordered some smaller ones, but they didn't arrive until after I finished this pair. For most of my glove seams, I don't tie a knot in the end of the thread, but I did for these ridges. I'm using a pin to help tie it, because the leather needle would damage the thread. My mother gave me these little clips a few years ago, and I never used them for regular sewing, but they're perfect for gloves because you can't pin leather without leaving permanent holes. My ridges are a bit thicker than I'd prefer, but I was worried about sewing too close to the fold with the size 7 needle. I think I'll be able to get a smaller ridge with a smaller needle. After I reached the top of the ridge, I sewed back through the last hole a second time. Switch to a regular needle when you do this, because the cutting edges on the leather needle will most likely damage your thread and make your tie-off less secure. I buried the end of the thread inside the ridge before cutting it off, which would also be very risky to do with a leather needle. Now it was time for the facing, and wow, I really did not think these through enough before cutting them out. I should have traced a new pattern and made the cuff slightly bigger to account for seam allowance, and I should have made the facing piece even bigger than that. In a lot of the pictures of extant gloves with facings, you can see what appears to be a little bit of the facing rolled to the outside, kind of like piping. I thought scooching it a bit lower and trimming the upper edge, combined with the curve around the wrist would be enough, which was very silly of me. I sewed the first facing on with whip stitches, since they're fast and easy. I should not have done it that way. And for the second facing I used stab stitching, which is a bit slower, but not too bad. If this were fabric I would do back stitching, but the leather would definitely hate that. 
I sprayed some water on to help work them into shape, but my poor pattern planning meant the little edge of facing wasn't going to sit as nicely as it could have. I sewed down the inside edge with large whip stitches, being careful not to poke through to the outside of the glove. I was having trouble getting them to stay smooth and flat, and you're not supposed to iron leather, so I dampened them again and left a heavy book on them overnight. Looking at the two finished cuffs, the stab stitched one is way better than the whip stitched one. It's so much smoother and the threads don't show at all. I did do a sample for this, but I guess I didn't make the whip stitch portion big enough to see how bad it looked. The thread wrapping around the seam allowances made them a lot stiffer, and they don't squish nicely into those inward curves, which of course seems perfectly obvious in hindsight. I was actually a little worried this would happen, but was hoping I could get away with whip stitches because they're slightly easier to do. Ah well. Next pair will be better. Now for the rest of the construction, where I actually have a decent idea of what I'm doing. The most common construction for thin leather gloves appears to be whip stitching with the seams left on the outside, and that's how I've done all my pairs. I always do the thumbs first. In order to make sure that it's centered, I lay my pattern back down and mark the middle on the back sides of the pieces where it won't be seen. I fold the thumb in half with the wrong sides together and take a stitch through both layers just above the bit where it dips in. I make sure that about two-thirds of my thread is on one side of the seam and the remaining third is on the other, and then I tie those two ends in a knot. I line up those two center marks on the thumb and thumb hole and clip them together. I line up the little point to the thumb piece, and using the longer thread, I start whip stitching the thumb to the thumb hole. I like to always put my needle in from the thumb side, because leather can have a tendency to curve slightly around the tip of the needle as you push it in, and this way any curving will happen around the thumb hole. I use a seam allowance of about 1 to 1.5 millimeters. Since the thread is waxed and the leather is pretty squishy, it doesn't want to move once it's sunken into the seam allowance. So if it's twisting off in the wrong direction, it's best to guide the stitch into place as you tighten it. Once I get back to the top of the pointy bit, I switch to a regular needle so I can sew through the last hole a second time without damaging the thread, and hide the thread tail inside the edge of the leather. Then I can put the leather needle onto the shorter tail of thread, and continue sewing up the length of the thumb. You could sew it all from the beginning with one length of thread, but the more you sew with it, the more the needle eye wears out the thread, so I like to divide it like this. I used to start my thumbs from the bottom though, which might be good if you're really worried about getting it centered, or are working on a mock-up and aren't sure yet how well it fits into the thumb hole. It's not how any of the extant examples I've zoomed in on were done, and it does leave the seam looking a bit less tidy, but it works. I would stitch through both pieces right on the center mark, again making sure there's about twice as much thread on one side as the other, before tying both ends in a knot. Then I'd sew up one side of the thumb hole using the shorter end of the thread. Once I got to the pointy bit, I'd switch to a regular needle and finish off the thread the same way as before. I'd put the leather needle on the other end of the thread and start sewing up the other half, still putting the needle in from the thumb side. Shortly after starting this way, it's a good idea to fold the thumb in half so you can line up the edges and clip them in place, to make sure you're sewing the thumb in evenly. On some previous thumbs, I have gotten it skewed and then ended up with a twisted thumb where I had to try and sew a longer edge to a shorter one. Then when you get to the pointy bit, you can just keep sewing the thumb closed, 
Since this is the right dove, I'm going to need to trim a few pieces down, because I have to keep three of my nails short in order to properly sew with a thimble. I've made the mistake before of trimming the thumb down at this stage without having the full glove sewn up, and taking off a bit too much length. I know this thumb looks fine, but it just feels too short. So I'm going to leave this end open for now, and move on to the fingers. Each fourchette needs to go in its proper place, and you should be able to tell which is which by comparing them to your numbered pattern pieces. You could even clip the fourchettes to their pattern pieces right after cutting out. Before I can sew in the fourchettes, I need to attach the quirks. I like to start my thread by burying it in the edge that I'm about to sew over. I line up one edge of the quirk along one inner edge of the fourchette, with the corner of the quirk about one millimeter further in than the inner corner on the fourchette. When I start sewing, I'm careful not to pull the thread out of where I buried it. I'm just going through this loop to help the first stitch stay in place. I sew down that side and up the other. Then I switch to a regular needle so I can sew back through the last hole and bury the end of the thread inside the seam without damaging it. Since I still have lots of thread left here, I started the next one with the regular needle, and sewed through the first hole twice before switching to a leather needle. It doesn't really matter which way you start the seam, either way works, and for these particular seams it doesn't matter which side you sew from. For the first one I put the needle in on the fourchette side, and for this one I'm sewing from the quirk side. I always sew the fourchettes into the top part of the glove first. The pointy end goes on the back of the hand. I first line up the ends by putting it wrong sides together like this, and taking a stitch through both pieces. I make sure both ends of thread are the same length, and then I tie them in a knot so they don't move, just like I did with the second thumb. I bend the fourchette around and take a couple of stitches so that it stays lined up in the right direction. And then I make sure the tips are lined up at the same height and clip them in place. If your pieces are dramatically different lengths and you can't get them to line up without stretching one of them a lot, you probably need to adjust your pattern, but only if you have that problem in the same place on both gloves. If it's only really off on one glove, then it's more likely that the leather just has a very uneven stretch, or perhaps a cutting mistake. If you just sew from the bottom of the seam without lining up the tops first, one piece might stretch out of shape more than the other, and unevenly lined up pieces can cause the fingers to twist. I have a few badly twisted fingers on some of the gloves I made before I figured out what I was doing wrong. That's also why it's good to sew from the same side while doing these pieces. Up till now I'd always sewn from the underside, so when I was attaching the fourchettes to the tops of the fingers I was putting my needle in through the fourchette, and when I got to the bottoms the needle always went in through the trank, but as I wrote this I realized that that still leaves both seams twisting in the same direction on the index finger, so I think from now on I'll always put the needle in from the fourchette side on all the seams, and that way they'll be as balanced as possible. But lining up the tops before sewing is more important. I'll leave a couple of centimeters open on the ends of the fingers here, since I'm going to trim them down later. Here's what I mean about needing to sew from the same direction. This seam is a bit twisted on its own, but once you have one on either side with the thread slanting in opposite directions, they balance each other out. If you sewed one seam from the fourchette side and one from the trank side, they'd just get more twisted. Once all those are attached, I sew them to the bottoms of the fingers, starting by tying the threads in the middle the same way. I find it easiest to work from the index finger out, 
clip the fingertips together and clip the four sets on near the tops to make sure they're lined up before I start lining up the rest of the seam. I could have sewn up these last two fingers without trying it on, because I know they fit and won't need trimming, but I left them open anyways. If you're sewing up your glove pattern for the first time and might have made the fingers a bit too long, if your hands are not symmetrical, or if you're using a leather that's way stretchier than whatever you used for your previous pair of gloves, then it's a good idea to do this. But once you've sewn it up a few times and are confident in your pattern, you should be fine just sewing them all closed without trying them on. Now there's only the side seam left to do, and when I lined up the cuffs it turned out that my facings did not end at quite the same spot, so that's another thing I need to mark on the pattern next time. Oops. Just like when I sewed on the quirks, I'm starting this off by hiding the thread using a regular needle, and then sewing through the same hole twice. Then I did that again on the next stitch, because this bit needs to be strong. After that I continued as usual with the leather needle. Now it's ready to try on. I think my thumbs are two different sizes. This piece usually fits over the left thumb even though that one has a much longer fingernail. The first two fingers needed about 4mm trimmed off them, including the ends of the four sets, which is less than the length of my nails, but it does still need to reach around the fingertip. Once the trimming is done, I can finish up the ends of all those seams as usual. On the left glove nothing needs trimming, so I didn't leave anything open. A couple of my nails are broken at the moment because they're more fragile in the winter, but they don't break very often, and I keep them at a pretty consistent length of 1cm, so that's what I make the fingers to fit over. And there we go. Gloves! with no twisted seams whatsoever, and with no visible knots of thread on the outside. The seam on the right thumb still feels a bit too short, even though the left one fits just fine over a longer nail, so I finally decided to make a separate pattern piece for it. And I might make a couple more, because I have had the same thumb pattern piece turn out both too short and too long, depending on the stretchiness of the leather. If the fingers feel a bit narrow the first time you try our gloves on, that's normal. And as long as they're real leather, they should stretch out to fit you perfectly after you wear them a few times. They're kind of geometric looking when you first finish them, but the more you wear them, the more they'll mold to the shape of your hands. 
As for the striped ones, they went together in almost exactly the same way, with the exception of the cuffs. I used nicer silk thread on these ones, so I measured out all my pieces to try and minimize the amount of waste. I'd measured how much I used on a previous pair of gloves, so I knew approximately how much it took for each seam. On these ones I sewed the thumbs from the middle, because I was worried about the stripes not lining up, but next time I make striped gloves I'll try them the usual way. I also sewed them with a regular needle instead of a leather needle, because at the time I didn't have any leather needles small enough. Since these ones are shorter and don't have those big round floppy bits, the side seam starts at the very edge and there is no facing. However, the original pair in the MFA does have a hem. I folded the edge under once and whip stitched it down, and it was much tougher to get the needle through at an angle than it was to stitch straight through, but that was mostly because I wasn't using a leather needle. I had never done a hem on gloves before because it's not really necessary on leather, but I like how it reinforces the edge so it doesn't pull out of shape quite as much as my other gloves do. I put my dragons facing inward so they can see each other and say hello, because they are of course good friends. Oh, I really need to try and set up some sort of designated photography background with decent lighting. Here you can see what I meant about the glove length changing with the sleeves. The short, later style of glove fits well with the long, tight 1790s coat sleeves, and the mid-century ones with larger cuffs work well with the shorter mid-century jacket sleeves. 
delighted with how these turned out. The main thing I would do differently is to just put the medallion a few millimeters closer to the thumb because I foolishly tried to account for the pattern adjustment when I shouldn't have, and the fingers turned out a bit loose for some reason. I know they don't look it, but they could stand to be a lot tighter, and it might be from having to redraw some of the outlines after I'd painted them. The edges of these stripes are not all perfectly smooth because of the texture of the leather, but I think it looks nice. Especially with the brown color scheme, the rough edges look kind of intentional. These are very tiny complaints though, everything else is great. As I already said, I like the hem, and I might go back and hem my other short gloves. If I had put the stripes lengthwise on the quirks, they would have blended in a lot better, but I think they look nice this way too. Kind of like the cow catcher on a train. Uh, and the plain ones were a learning experience, but they're not too bad. And I know that next time I do cuff facings, they'll be a lot better. And I even got a bit better at the regular construction part as I was doing these. I think the stiffer cuff looks really nice, and it would be fun to do one with a contrast facing. I might add a bit of trim to these though, so nobody at the grocery store sees my hideous left cuff and judges me for it. The three lines of decorative whip stitching took a little bit of width off, but not enough to make any significant difference in the fit, as far as I can tell. My pattern is still not quite perfect, and I think I'll redraw it so that the fingers are angled in a bit more, and a bit more of a flared wrist for the versions with the big decorative cuffs, because this part right here is a weak point that I don't want to put too much strain on. There are still slight differences in the fit of every pair, even where I haven't changed the pattern, and I think that's mostly just because leather has such an uneven stretch in just lots of directions. This is only the eighth pair of gloves I've ever made, and this is the ninth, and I'm sure I'll keep improving the more pairs I make. I said in my intro that my first two pairs were very bad, and I'd like to talk more about what exactly went wrong with them so that you can hopefully avoid some of those mistakes. So this is the first pair of gloves I ever made, and they are also striped mainly inspired by the MFA pair, but also by some green and black striped gloves I saw in two different fashion plates from 1790. I have since realized that those ones are probably knit gloves because stripes going around the hand doesn't make sense with leather because it would be so hard to line up. And there's a nearly identical pair of extant knit ones in the glove collection trust, but I have also seen some plain green, probably leather ones in fashion plates, so I think green and black striped leather gloves are plausible, but I'm not always going for accuracy. That's not the problem here. The problem is the materials I used for them. They might not look that bad, but they are. Instead of getting new leather, I used pieces from an old leather jacket, which was decently thin and soft, but it turned out to be really weak. I tore one of the cuffs very badly while putting them on, not long after I made them. But what's worse is the fact that I didn't have any leather paint and I didn't think to buy any leather paint, so I very foolishly used green fabric printing ink on them. Not even fabric paint, this stuff that's meant for screen printing on fabric, which is very different from painting on leather, and it does not stick well to leather. And on the samples, it started peeling off. So I thought, oh, I'll just coat it with something. But still not wanting to buy any new materials, I coated it with some kind of varnish from my stash that I think was meant for paintings? Horrible idea. The bottle said it dries flexible, but flexible does not mean the same thing as stretchy. So of course it started flaking off, which is what all this whitish stuff is. And then the green started flaking off too. These ones I actually did mask with washi tape, but it was from a different package that had a lot more of the 3mm stuff. My second pair is better, but still bad. These ones were cut from an old suede skirt, which was a nice thickness and a lot stronger than the jacket leather, but has basically no stretch. So they're technically wearable, but they don't fit and they're not very comfortable. I love reusing materials, and sewing from your stash is great, but I think the lesson here is that that doesn't always work. You can make a waistcoat out of any old garbage, but for some projects you really need to buy the right materials, and leather gloves are one of those things. And the right tools. Get some leather needles and they will save your hands a lot of strain. I also made a regrettable choice with these ones when I painted them with dye. This was before I had bought any black leather paint, but I had some black leather dye in my stash, which was easy to paint with. And my sample turned out fine, but then on the actual gloves it started smudging. It's not showing up well on camera, but it is smudged in several places. I think it was because on the sample I did one coat, but I did two coats on the gloves because I wanted it to be darker. The dye also dried out pretty quickly and got really thick when I had it in a little paint palette, so I think I ended up with too much pigment on the surface because of that. I didn't notice the smudging until after I'd sewn them up, and I tried fixing it by coating them with acrylic resiline, which did stop the smudging, but it kind of ruined the texture. They got a lot less breathable and a lot more wrinkly. And there are some dark spots where it soaked into the seams, but that part only happened because I painted it after sewing them up. They also have that kind of tacky texture that acrylic finishes sometimes have, where they're sort of squeaky and stick to themselves really easily. It's diminished a bit with wear, but mm, it still just doesn't... It still just doesn't feel as nice as the plain leather 
Gloves do naturally get wrinkly when you wear them, but not this much. I've worn these almost the same amount, and these ones are so much worse, so I do not recommend this stuff for gloves. Unless you're distressing a costume and want the gloves to look all gross and scrungly. Also, just to be clear, these ones are not historically accurate and are not meant to be. I based this design off a motif I found in an 1890s book because I think Art Nouveau and mid-18th century menswear go together very well, and I can sew whatever I want. This is the pair I wear most often, so I'm definitely going to make more, and I'm going to use actual leather paint this time, and I'm going to make good versions of my first two pairs because I still want plain black ones and stripy teal ones. To any Canadians watching, I would strongly advise against buying leather from Fabricville, or Fabricland depending on what province you're in. I've only bought one hide from them, and I will never do it again. It's this beautiful dark purple one, and it's very soft and stretchy, but it is so much weaker than the ones from Italian skins. It's a lot easier to stick a regular needle through this stuff, but some of the stitches on this pair are already tearing a bit, and I've barely worn them at all. And it stains really badly. If my hands get wet in these gloves, they will turn extremely purple, and it's shockingly hard to scrub off. To be fair, I have not been rained on in gloves made of any other dark leather yet, so maybe they all do this to some degree, but if so, I can't imagine it's this bad. My fingertips were just... grapes. Even sweating a little bit in these, I still got purpled. The fabric fill stuff is cheaper than ordering leather online, but it's not worth it. And a cheaper hide is still not cheap, so I think it's better to get a good hide than to waste your money on a crappy one that won't last as long. And you should usually be able to get two or three pairs of gloves out of one, unless they're really long. So the price per pair is not terrible. And neither is the price of thread for something so small, so I really need to just order more silk twist and actually use it. I don't know why I've gotten better at using up nice fabric but not nice thread. I've made two pairs of gloves out of this purple one, and I have enough left for one more. And I probably will make another pair, but I'm not happy about it. If you have any suggestions for good places you like to buy leather from, please leave them in the comments, because I don't know very many. And please tell me if you know of any other marking tools that work on glove leather, because right now all I've got is pigment liners for light colors and white gel pens for dark ones. I'm pretty new to leather working, and it seems like most of the information out there is about much thicker stuff, so these gloves have been a lot of trial and error, and I'm sure I still have more to improve on. I've been wearing these a lot for every day, and it's so nice. As long as it's cold enough out not to sweat in them, I've been wearing gloves pretty much every time I leave the house. They're not super warm, but since they're a lot thinner than most modern leather gloves, they fit nicely underneath mittens. So you can take off your mittens and unlock your door without exposing your bare hand to below freezing temperatures. And it's comforting to have them on when touching things like bus rails or crosswalk buttons, or if you have to shake someone's hand, because there is still a plague going on. When I go to the store, I just keep them on the whole time, and they don't get in the way of anything. I have so much dexterity in these gloves. I don't even have to take them off when going through a self-checkout because they work on touch screens. May I demonstrate on your phone? I can't demonstrate on my phone because I only have a flip phone. I like to wash my hands right before putting them on so the insides stay as clean as possible. The light-colored ones do get visibly dirty on the outside pretty quickly. I've tried using water and leather cleaner on them, and that doesn't get all the stains out, but it does help. I'm going to have to go back and scrub the rest of these ones more thoroughly, and get the whole thing damp because it left some water stains, but you can see that this finger looks cleaner now. I have had a pair of these get completely soaked in a rainstorm, and they were fine. I just carefully smoothed them out and propped them up so they wouldn't dry wrinkly. They'll be stiffer after they dry, but like a towel dried on the clothesline, they'll soften up again once you move them around a bit. However, I do need to look into getting some sort of leather conditioner to replace whatever oils I might have washed away. Because they seem fine, but I don't want the washing to weaken them over time. I've read that you shouldn't use heat on leather because that also damages it. I tried ironing a scrap on the hottest setting of my iron to see what it would do, and it still feels the same, but apparently it can cause it to dry out and crack over time, so I'm just going to avoid ironing them. Just because it doesn't instantly turn into a potato chip doesn't mean there's no damage, and they don't need ironing. Anyways, I hope some of you make some, and if you do, I would love to see pictures. Gloves are one of those things that were very common historically, but are often neglected in costuming. They're also the perfect project to take with you if you go out of town for the weekend, because they're so small and there's no ironing or pins, and they don't take very long. I haven't timed it yet, but I think the sewing up is only about 10 to 12 hours. Okay, I think that's it for now. Uh, thank you to Lee for lending me a hand, and thank you to Julia for sending me these needles in this lovely needle book, and thank you to my patrons for making this video possible, and for making it so I don't have to panic about how few hours I've been getting at my alterations job. My Patreon is mostly dinosaur cartoons, but I have recently decided that I'm also going to do monthly behind-the-scenes posts about whatever sewing videos I'm working on next. Remember to do samples! We should both say goodbye so we can put that clip at the end of the video. Yes. Bye. Bye.